Hey guys, thanks for tuning in. Today is the second part of my conversation with Stephen Ewan. Part one aired last week, so make sure you check it out so that you don't miss anything. Now, on with the show. Welcome to the Plan B CRNA podcast. I'm your host, Bobby Jones, and I'm so excited that you're here. The Plan B CRNA podcast is the only show made specifically for nurse anesthetists who are exploring options outside of their traditional career paths. This is the place to expand your mind and your goals as we uncover new ways to produce side income together. Join me for some honest, unscripted discussions with other CRNAs who are transforming their financial lives. This episode is brought to you by On Call Capital. On Call Capital is dedicated to educating CRNAs and other healthcare providers about investing outside of the traditional stock market. On Call Capital also provides opportunities for you, yes, you, to create passive income and generational wealth while also lowering your taxable income through investments in the apartment and alternative investment spaces. If you haven't hit subscribe yet, make sure you do that right now so that you don't miss an episode. Thanks so much for joining me today. And now on with the show. So you now have two apartment complexes, but that's not all that you have. You also have a, a different asset class that you started to get into. So, you know, tell me, tell me a little bit more about your growth and how that has, has happened. And, and then it brings you to mobile home parks. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, kind of my timeline at a high level. So my, my first single family home, which was a house hack was in 2017. My second house hack was in 2019, which is a single family home. My third house hack was in 2020. My out of state single family home was in early 2021. And then in mid 2021, I got my 26 unit apartment complex. Mm -hmm. End of 2021, I got my 20 unit apartment complex. <laughs> oh, wow. So you've had them both uh, for a couple of years. Okay. Yeah. And then my mobile home part came like mid 2022. Okay. So, and then keep in mind, I'm doing this without partners. I don't actually have partners in any of my deals mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. while working full time mm -hmm. as a pharmacy director. And I'm doing, they're all heavy value add, right? Yeah. So for some context in the past year, between my two apartments and my mobile park, I probably renovated about 40 units. Mm -hmm. just one year, which is, makes me a high level flipper, yeah. <laughs> you know, we way. but what kind of led me to the mobile home park? I mean, honestly, it, it was shiny object syndrome for lack of a better word. <laughs> uh, a lot of people you, and you hear in all these podcasts, when you go to apartments, the next step is, oh, I heard mobile home parks can make you a lot of money, right? It's high cash flow. It can make you a lot of money. And I just saw a deal and ironically, this one was actually on LoopNet where I could buy a 200 lot mobile home park in Alabama. It was a high vacancy. It was a huge turnaround park with a lot of park owned homes, but I just needed down 10%, $100,000 down. And I could own 55 acres of land, 200 lots. And I had about maybe 40 homes of actually, you know, or maybe about 30 where tenants were actually paying rent. Hmm. So I just thought, well, what's the cost of a single family home in California? Right. Yeah. That's yeah, literally yeah. the same. Like I, I literally bought a house in San Francisco for 1.1 million. I put a hundred thousand dollars down. This is the mm -hmm. same deal. I was like, but if I can fill up this park to full capacity and it's going to take like 10 years to do it, I'll mm -hmm. be honest, it'll be worth 10 million plus. Yeah. So the upside was insane. So that's what kind of drew me to the deal. Like I didn't really know much about mobile parks. Honestly, like the moment I got the park under contract, I listened to like a bunch of podcasts about mobile home parks. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what kind of led me into it. And I just thought, you know, from my experience, because my park is, so for context, there's two, there's the two models. There's tenant owned homes. You listen to all podcasts. That's what they advocate for. Mm -hmm. It's tenant owned homes where they just pay you lot rent. They own the home and they pay you lot rent every month. Mm -hmm. And it's supposed to be more passive, right? Because they do all the maintenance. If their toilet breaks, they fix their toilet. If the window breaks, they fix their window. All they have to do is pay you the lot rent in the Southeast. That's roughly around $300, 250, 300 lot rent. Mm -hmm. And as long as they pay their rent and they play by the rules, you know, mow their lawn, do all that stuff. Mm -hmm. That's all you're really doing. Yeah. But in the Southeast, a popular model is the park owned home model. So you as a landlord will own the home. So it's almost like a rental, right? Okay. It's basically a rental unit where I own the home, I'll rent it out to you. And then I hope to convert you over to like Maybe down the road, you buy the home off me or mm -hmm. you go to rent to own model. Okay. It takes about, you know, five years typically for the whole contract, the rent to own contract to go all the way through. 
And a lot of people fail out because being a renter versus being a homeowner is a different mindset, right? Yes. Rent to own sounds appealing, right? right? Like usually let's say rent's $500 a month. I'll do a rent to own contract at 550. That's an extra $50 a month over five years. And basically that's their payment to me to mm -hmm. eventually own the home. And then once they own the home, it's theirs. But when they're under rent to own contract, the moment one thing breaks down, the water here breaks down, it's $500, they can't afford it. Yeah. Now the contract's broken, right? Yeah. So that's just kind of the reality of it. But, you know, I kind of went to the weeds a little bit there, but at a high level, I just really like the potential where you can force a lot of appreciation mm -hmm. by bringing in a lot of like new mobile homes. And as you bring in more homes, you get more cash flow. And I was hoping that would be my golden goose into yeah. like, you know, retirement. So that's what kind yeah. of drew me towards the mobile home park that I got. Okay. Cool. And so, but, but like you mentioned this whole time, you, you have kept your full-time job in pharmacy and you have taken the extra money that you make from being a pharmacist and put it into some of these deals. So, you know, that, I think that's something that, you know, is, is a really powerful tool for, you know, the, these, you know, advanced practice professionals who, you know, they're trying to get into some of these things, you know, W2, I mean, you could have just taken and just shoveled money into your 401k, right? Mm -hmm. And and it sounds like you're still doing some of those things, but you're also diversifying outside of the stock market and and you're finding a lot of value there, which I think is incredible. You, you're you taking on the education yourself, you know, you're learning from other people who have done it, obviously, yeah. but but you're taking it on and you're taking these jumps because you have that security blanket of, hey, you know what? I, I still have this job to fall back on, you know? And and I think that's a, a powerful, powerful tool. Yeah, I, I think a lot of, you know, if you listen to a lot of YouTube videos and podcasts, you always see headlines like, oh, I retired in two years with like 10 units, mm -hmm. you know, left my W-2. And for me, it's a little bit clickbait because I, I own 90 units of real estate, still working a full-time W-2. Like if, mm -hmm. if I told anyone I own 90 units, they would assume I'm already retired uh, on a yacht somewhere, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> always by the beach. But, you know, a lot of these assets, it takes time. Like it takes, as you mentioned earlier, two or three years to stabilize an apartment complex. Mm -hmm. It takes, well, as I mentioned earlier, five to 10 years to stabilize a mobile home park. And the psychology of, writing large checks for renovations every month. That's more than my W2 income. You know, it doesn't feel great. I'll be honest. Right. Yeah, and you're writing, yeah. you're imagine writing $50,000 checks every month for renovation for all three of my assets. Mm -hmm. And even if I'm taking on, let's say $10,000 a month, like it's still a drop in the bucket, relatively speaking. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, people kind of ask me, how did I self fund everything? And I actually just cashed out refinance my single family homes. When mm -hmm. they went up in value, I mentioned my first deal I got, it went up by half a million dollars. You know, I had half a million equity in there. I just did a cash out refi, pulled out a bunch of money, and then I can use that as down payments for my apartment complexes, mobile home park, as well as for renovation. Mm -hmm. And because I have a high income W2, I can apply for lines of credits, right? Yeah. I can get personal line of credit. I can get HELOCs. I can get, actually have a line of credit against my stock portfolio mm -hmm. through Charles Schwab. So I, that's how I invest in everything. Like I know people are all stocks, all real estate. I actually do, but I do all the above, mm -hmm. right? I still invest in stocks. I take a line of credit against my stocks. I can use that to buy real estate, mm -hmm. right? My real estate goes up in value. I do a cash out refi, pull the money back out and then buy another piece of real estate. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of like becoming your own bank and using leverage a little bit. You do have to have a little bit of a risk tolerance, I will say. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously me scaling so rapidly, I kind of, as you can imagine, push myself to the limit. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's doing three heavy value add projects while working a full time W two. It, it's not for the faint of heart. Yeah, uh, you know. So because of that, I, I am you know currently trying to flip my mobile home park. Mm -hmm. so, you know, currently in, under contract with that right now. I just mm -hmm. said, hey, you know, I've taken on a little bit too much, and I basically got the offer price. That I just thought, you know, I can't not say no to this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So my goal is just to get rid of that asset and then double down on apartments. So mm -hmm. that's why I kind of mentioned shiny object syndrome. Like it would have been a lot easier on me if I just, instead of buying that mobile home park, actually doubled down into apartments in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Cause I already have a good team there, a good system there. And it's a little bit less, it's a little bit less work for me, but the upside may not be as much. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, what do you want? If you want more upside, mobile home park all the way, but it's way more work. Like yeah. for context, I probably spent 80% of my time towards a mobile home park. 
mm-hmm. and the remaining twenty percent is my two apartment complexes. Yeah. And I'm renovating yeah. both of them, but that's how active you have to be with mobile home parks. Despite me having an on-site manager and an off-site manager, I'm still heavily involved as the owner because you will never care as much about your asset as yourself. Like your yeah. property managers, unfortunately, especially in mobile home parks, there's not many good third-party managers for mobile home parks. Like it's not like apartments where you could fire your property manager and you get 10 that line up after. Yeah. But mobile yeah. Home parks, you got like maybe one or two to choose from and at best they're both C's. So you're working with two people who are C's and you constantly have to push them. And, you know, cause like time is money, right? Every day that you're delaying, um, that's costing you money, right? Whether you're trying to sell it every day, it's delayed. That's costing you money. Every day that renovation is delayed, that's costing you money. So you constantly have to be on top of it. So that's just kind of what I learned by, by scaling rapidly. Mm-hmm. Um, it's impressive what I've done, but yeah, I just want to give you some context as to kind of the reality of what it looks like. When yeah. You well, and I think that, you know, the thing too, is like you said, you have really pushed it. People could get to where you are in a longer time frame, and perhaps it be a more comfortable experience for them. It's, th- this isn't a one, you know, one size fits all kind of thing. Like, you can you can take your own route to it and and figure out your own path and what you're comfortable with and still come out of it and and have some really wonderful assets. It just depends on the path that you're you know willing and ready to take. Exactly. No, I'm, I'm glad you said that because I could have gotten to where I'm at too. Yeah, over a more gradual time frame, but you know, I was just such in that like buying mode that I was so hyper focused. And the funny part is I even had, after these three, I had a, another, a fourth asset under contract. It was an RV mobile home park as well. Mm-hmm. And thank God that fell out of escrow because of due diligence, because I would have gone crazy <laughs> if I bought that one on top of all I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like I said, just give it time and then be patient. And that's what I'm kind of learning. But in the moment, you know, I'll just head down. I was so focused on just buying as much as I could. But looking back, I just said, you know, if I just maybe bought another apartment complex, in Oklahoma, I'd be a lot less stressed and it's scaled more scalable because instead of talking to three different property managers, I'm just talking to one who's managing all three. Yeah. So, you know, we don't think about that stuff. I was just more of like, hey, I have this great deal in Alabama. I want to jump on it. But I kind of knew in the back of my mind when I got under contract that I got this for a million dollars, 200 lots. That's about $5,000 per lot. Mm-hmm. It cost $20,000 to build a lot in Alabama. Mm-hmm. So I already knew I had margin in there. So my yeah. goal, I already kind of knew in the back of my mind that I just need to prove a model, mm-hmm. right? So I can fix up some of these homes, rent it out, actually brought in brand new homes, 100% financed through Clayton. And I rented them out for $70. Mm-hmm. And I think my monthly payment was around $400. So I had a $300 spread. Mm-hmm. I did that for two homes. And I presented that model to a larger syndicator. And they're the ones who are buying my property or my mobile home park now. Okay. So okay. In terms of my exit, I could have, I just can outright sell it, or I can say, "Hey, give me some equity in the deal. You take over the rest." Yeah. It's like yeah, get a piece of the pie, and benefit of the upside, mm-hmm. right? Or if I just want to be cashed out, which I, that's why I chose to do. I, I just chose mm-hmm. to be cashed out. Yeah. To kind of take a little break, you know, it's tiring. Yeah. Um, yeah. Basically, get my money back out. That all the money I put in plus some profits, and then finish burying my two apartment complexes. And once all that's done, I can go buy like a 50 to 100 unit apartment complex, in Oklahoma, and then, you know, scale even further. So yeah, yeah. as you got to take two steps back or one step back, take three steps forward. So yeah. I think that's kind of the realization that I'm kind of going through right now. Yeah. I think a lot of people don't have that context because, you know, it, it just kind of like threw me off. I'm like, man, I, I own 90 units of real estate and I feel mm-hmm. poor. Like I feel like I'm so poor. Despite you know, making a good W2, I own 90 units of real estate. Like no one would tell me that I'm poor, but like just the feeling of like leading, writing checks every month and, and, you know, you're waiting like two, three years to stabilize these assets. Like you just feel really poor, but I guess in a weird way, it keeps you humble because yeah. <laughs> I can't lifestyle inflate when I feel, you know, that I'm not doing that well financially. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, and I think there's a, there's a cost to growth. You know, because you're you're not taking profits right now. You're constantly feeding those profits back into, you know, this venture that you're going through. And and so that part of it, I think, 
a lot of people have this misnomer that, you know, okay, well, I'm going to own some real estate and then it's going to cover all this stuff when it's like, you know, well, getting to that point where you own that level of real estate to really be comfortable, while that may be different for everybody and that that number of units that you need may be different for everybody depending on their own finances, it's still a process to get there. And and so the more units you actually feel like you need in order to be comfortable, well, that's a, a bigger process to get there. And you're going to feel like you have where you're you're kind of feel poor along the way, you know. Yeah. You know, I've I, anybody that buys a single family home, it's like, okay, well, now you're going to get, a, you know, maybe a couple hundred bucks a month to clear, yeah. you know, if you've got a mortgage on it and everything else. Now, if you, if you pay for it outright, then that's different. You know, my parents, they, you know, bought pieces of property uh, along the way. And my mom is one of those people too, where she wants to pay it off, pay it off as soon as she can. And so now she owns, you know, a, a piece of rental property in middle Georgia and she makes, you know, after costs and everything else, it's probably, you know, a thousand bucks a month or something on that, that piece of property. So that's, that's a nice thing to have when you fully own a property, but she had to sacrifice a lot of cash flow and actually pay out extra to pay that property off in a timely fashion. So it's, there are all these little trade-offs that you can choose to make or not make and along the way. And so it really depends on what your goals are. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head there. I mean, it's like personal, right? So like mm -hmm. operating accumulation phase, obviously. And, you know, for context, for apartments, the markets I'm investing in, after it's stabilized, you're probably profiting around $200 per unit, mm -hmm. right? So if you have 50 units, that's about $10,000 net cash flow a month once yeah. it's stabilized. But yes, it's going to take around 10 years for you to lay that foundation. But maybe I get to the point where I don't want to scale anymore. Maybe I'm comfortable with $10,000 a month. I don't want to take on the additional stress or don't want to do heavy value add deals where I'm buying more turnkey apartments where I'm paying market price, but it doesn't require work. Yeah. So I just really like right now I'm buying the, the heavy value add ones where if I'm buying it at a discount, I'm renovating it and then doubling, tripling the value. But you might hit the point where you don't want to do all that anymore. And you just buy something at market price, you'll make whatever five, six percent cash on cash return, which is great. Mm -hmm. Then you'll have less work and you just make more money as the rents naturally increase every year. Yeah. So I think, but I think what a lot of people don't understand is like it takes about 10 years of you doing it and like just putting your head down, putting in that work for 10 years. And then after that 10 year segment, it just gets better and better after that. Mm -hmm. Right. So imagine if I bought 100 units in 10 years. Well, the next 10 year segment, it'll be easy for me to buy 500 units. Yeah. Then the next thing you're saying, man, you can go a thousand units if you want to, mm -hmm. right? Like once you have that track record, you know, it's easy for me to go and raise money if I want to syndicate, mm -hmm. right? I say, like, Hey, I already stabilized, you know, three apartments in Oklahoma. I already have a team there. Great. I can take down bigger apartment complexes mm -hmm. and I have skin in the game because I've done it with my own money and I've proven the model. I know exactly like how much the rents are, Yeah, yeah. how to renovate it. I have a system there. I have a team there. Like mm -hmm. it's going to be so easy for me to raise money if I want to do it. Right. But then yeah. you raise money. It's a different set of stress, right? Because now you own a business and you have to re respond to investors, right? Yeah. call you. Yeah. And if you don't want to deal with that, then maybe you don't want to syndicate. You just can gradually buy your own portfolio. So it just yeah. really depends what your why is. And, and for me, it's, for me, it's just really freedom and options. Mm -hmm. And right now the thought of responding to investors doesn't seem appealing to me, <laughs> but maybe down the road, once I'm retired from my W2, maybe, maybe I'll have an inkling to want to do it. But, yeah. you know, right now it just doesn't make sense. I just rather have my own, I'd rather own 20 units myself versus like 2% of, you know, a hundred units. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and I, I, I think, you know, you, you touched on a good point there where, you know, like, Hey, it's, it, this is not an overnight kind of success, even though you've, you know, you've obviously busted your hump for the last, you know, 10 years to get to where you paid off those loans and then you're getting into real estate and you have all these assets now. But it was a 10-year process to get there. Now, you're in a much better place than, than a lot of other people would be after 10 years in, yeah. in their career. And, and, and I think that's, it's, it's a, a bit of a mindset shift in that, you know, like, okay, well, that, that sounds like a lot of work what you're doing. And so I'd rather just put my money in and, you know, but that's, that's where, you know, like if, if people are investing in, you know, just the stock market or, or they're investing certain ways in real estate, like things can take longer or shorter depending on what you do. But 
but like a lot of people seem to be completely comfortable with, Hey, I'm going to take, I'm going to have this job and it's a high paying job and I'm just going to work the next 30 years and then I'm going to retire when yeah. I'm 60 or whatever. Yeah. And I think what you're doing, it, it, it gives you options. That's the main thing is that you have options since you have diversified your portfolio amongst stocks and real estate, you can take at, at any point and take the equity out of that, you know, out of the homes that you bought and you could put that back into the stock market and then just let it passively go. You know, so if you see these dips in the market, like we've seen lately, well, you know that things aren't going to stay that way forever. So mm -hmm. you might be able to buy at a discount, you know, some of these, these stocks that you see. So there's a lot to be said for the options that you're providing for yourself along the way by trying to really diversify. Yeah, exactly. So like I said, a lot of people, they can you imagine pulling out like a million dollars from a piece of property at like three, 4% interest. And then you're able to just to dump that into the S&P 500, which averages, you know, seven, 8% over the long run. Mm -hmm. And that's just passive, right? Like mm -hmm. you just, you just dump it there, forget about it. Uh, so it really depends. I mean, I will say, I mean, I know real estate's not for everybody. Like I said, you have to have a certain risk tolerance. You have to be willing to learn a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, like I did three asset classes in the span of like a couple of years. But for me, what really helped me is just by doing it. Like I'm the type of person where like, I'll try it and I see if I like it or not. Like, yeah, I, yeah. Even if you listen to podcasts or Learn, or you can learn from other people too. Mm -hmm. But I think the issue that I'm coming across with a lot of content is people aren't being, they're, they're giving you the dark side of it. They're just telling you all the great benefits of like real estate. Because, mm -hmm. you know, usually they're trying to sell you something. But for mm -hmm. me, I just give the truth. I'm like, I'm actually doing it. I'm just sharing my experience. Like mm -hmm. every time I take over an apartment complex, you're going to have turnover. Like I've taken over my 26 unit. I had three tenants stop paying me. Mm -hmm. uh, I had to evict them. And then I had two tenants just leave once I started renovating. So mm -hmm. right there, I had a 10% cash on cash return on paper when I underwrote the deal. But once you have five tenants leave, you're not, you're not 10% cash on cash return anymore. You're probably mm -hmm. slightly negative or breaking even. Yeah. Right. Like that's five tenants. That's $500 each. That's $2,500. Like you're yeah. probably negative at this point, but that's why it's key to buy right. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to go in and I bought this with $250,000 equity day one. So I knew worst case, even if I flop, I can make $250,000 yeah. if I sell yeah. this, right? And then I'm buying it with equity day one and I'm able to force depreciation mm -hmm. with a proven model. So, you know, it, it takes time to get there too, right? Because like when I'm mm -hmm. renovating, it tends to know, right? Like we start renovating one unit, they, they hear the next door like, oh, oh shoot, yeah. I'm going to leave because they're going to raise the rents, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then they don't want to deal with the noise. So like I renovate three units, I rent them out, another three will leave. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of like chasing your tail until eventually all 26 are renovated. Yeah. And uh, now you have a new tenant base, mm -hmm. you have a higher rent, and that's when you start cash flow. But it takes like three years to get there because when you renovate, you know, there's always delays. There are. Labor delays, supply delays. Maybe they ripped open a wall as a bigger, dam more damage than anticipated. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the weather might be bad. They can't work on it. Yeah. So there's all yeah. these delays. And but if you give that asset three years to five years to stabilize and you cash out refinance, that's life changing money. Yeah. Yeah. You know? It can't like, be. Like, you know, a couple like and it's like tax free. Yeah. Life changing yeah. Money. No, for sure, man. So I, I want to touch on because you've obviously had to educate yourself a lot. What kind of resources did you use? for your education when it came to apartments and mobile home parks? I mean, you mentioned podcasts. Were there any specific resources regarding that? Yeah. So for me, I started off listening to the Bigger Pockets mm -hmm. uh, podcast. I mean, I think it's great to get you interested in real estate, but I feel like where it's a little bit lacking is it doesn't give you the realistic expectations of what it's like to own an apartment mm -hmm. complex, mm -hmm. but it's good to give you like the high level, like positive points about it. And then from mobile home parks, I listened to, I think it was like Kevin Buck. He has like a nice podcast about mobile home parks. Mm -hmm. um, he has also the, you know, the Frank and Dave boot camp. I didn't actually do that one. Okay. Uh, but for me, it was just really leveraging my property managers. So both my property managers, you know, they've been like my apartment one, he's, they've been in the industry for about 20 years. So you can learn a lot from them mm -hmm. from your ground. Same with my mobile home park, third party management, you know, they operate 70 parks in the Southeast. Mm -hmm. uh, so they have a lot of skills and experience, but 
as I'm kind of going through it, like even though they've been in the industry for like 30 years and managing 70 parks, doesn't mean they'll tell you the stuff that you need to hear at the right time. Yeah. So it's just a combination of like, you know, bigger pockets, podcasts, YouTube, there's a lot of content. You know, I create content now where I kind of talk about my journey and mm -hmm. my experience unfiltered about what I'm going yeah. through. Yeah. To give people that perspective. Cause yes, mobile home parks does sound great, but I learned so much from my mobile home park just doing it. Mm -hmm. Like it's a lot more work than people are portraying out there. And you, it really takes a full-time team, which is what kind of led me to you know, just offloading my own mobile park to a large syndicator. Because those syndicators, they have teams, right? Where they can deploy. Like, I felt like I needed to be at my park physically. Like, that's how mm -hmm. much mm -hmm. work it is. Where I'm living in one of those homes and I'm there on a day-to-day -day basis making sure things are done. Mm -hmm. But I can't mm -hmm. obviously do that working a full-time W2. That's not what I want to do, right? That's not yeah. what I want to yeah. do. Yeah, exactly. So I quickly realized that, you know what? I tried it. It's not for me. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot about it. It's time for me to flip this to a larger syndicator. And then it made me realize, okay, if I ever want to invest in mobile and parks down the road, I'd probably invest in a syndication with one of the top five operators because yeah. they have a team there. They're vertically integrated. Mm -hmm. And I learned that you have to be vertically integrated because third-party management is terrible. Renovation yeah. workers are flaky, especially yeah. mobile and parks. Yeah. But if you have both those in-house, you have control over those two factors as well as installation. You need your own installer. So if they have all three of those in house, I know that they can make that park run more smooth. And even with all that house, it's still going to be a complete tornado and a mess despite yeah. everything in house. So that's why I learned. And it made me respect that if you want to do mobile home parks, you better be committed to buying 10 plus mobile home parks. Mm -hmm. If you want one or two, you're better off investing in this indication or just buying something very turnkey. Mm -hmm. uh, in a state that you live that you can drive to maybe once a quarter, right? So yeah. if I were to buy a mobile park, I would want to buy in California, mostly tenant owned homes and probably turn key where I'm just getting like whatever, three to 5% cash to cash return. And it's just naturally raising it. Yeah. And you get a lot of like, I mean, mobile parks is more about, you know, depreciation than it is mm -hmm. cash flow. I think in my, after kind of learning about it, it's not as much cash flow. It's actually more about forced depreciation and depreciation for your tax write-offs. Man, so. you just dropped a lot of knowledge right then. So I I, I <laughs> definitely appreciate that. You know, people I'm sure are going to be like rewinding and re-listening to this, but, uh, but man, this is, this has been a blast. I'm sure that there are people out there who want to get a hold of you, what they want to reach out to you and find out more information about you and your journey. How can they do that? Yeah. So I'll give you my link tree so you can find all my social medias, but I'm on YouTube. You just can search my name, Stephen Nguyen, or Making Multifamily Money. If you do that on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, I'm on all platforms, on LinkedIn as well. But I actually host weekly Q&A sessions every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Pacific time. It's open to everybody. It's free. And okay. basically, I, I usually teach for the first like 15 minutes. At the end, it's just a general Q&A. So it's great for beginners to come in and, and really learn from people who are actually in the trenches, like myself. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not talking about concepts. I'm actually telling you what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis and how I'm managing my properties, like what I've learned. Like, hey, I talked to my property manager. Like, this is what I learned this week. And yeah. Yeah. I hope to kind of give people a more realistic expectation of what to expect when investing in real estate. That's mm -hmm. kind of my, my goal and my journey. So that's how they can kind of find me. Awesome, man. Well, hey, it, this is... This has been a blast. I I just have to thank you again, man, for for everything that you're doing, for being on the show and sharing all of this knowledge. This was really a great time for me, and I'm sure it was a great time for the listeners as well. And, and thank you for letting me share my journey. You know, I know I went through a lot really fast <laughs> <laughs> over ten years. Yeah, but uh, you know, happy to come on as many times as, as needed to, to give value to your audience. And if there's a specific topic they want me to discuss. Happy to do a deep dive. Like I said, it was just very high level. You know, surface yeah. level stuff. Yeah, let's let's do it, man. Let's let's put something on the calendar, and we will make sure we get that done. But uh, but yeah, man. Hey, thanks for being here today, and and uh, thanks for everything you do. Awesome, thank you, Bobby. Have a good one. You too. There are a couple of things that really stood out to me about Stephen's journey. First, he isn't afraid to take the leap. A lot of people happen to be stuck on the sidelines with analysis paralysis, but Stephen has jumped right in to set himself up for the future. And secondly, he understands that in order to grow, you have to make sacrifices. His pharmacy career provides him with a great salary that gives him a lot of options for investing. And many CRNAs are in the same or an even better situation. And Stephen hasn't been susceptible 
to lifestyle creep. I mean, he doesn't drive a fancy car or spend a lot of money on material things. Instead, he focuses on personal and financial growth. And that's the real way to build sustainable success. That's going to do it for the show. If you enjoyed what you heard, make sure you hit subscribe and give us a five-star rating and review. I, I do check those out all the time and use those for future episodes. And if you'd like to get a hold of Steven, make sure you check out the show notes to get his contact info and YouTube link. This is Bobby Jones signing off. Till next time, stay safe and take care of each other out there. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of the Plan B CRNA podcast. If you haven't already subscribed and reviewed the show, I'd be honored if you took the extra time. It really helps to expand our reach and get the word out about the show. If you're a CRNA who is interested in sharing your story on our podcast, I'd love to have you. Please email me at bobby at oncallinvestments.com for more information. This episode was brought to you by On Call Capital. They are dedicated to helping providers like you develop passive income and generational wealth through investments in the apartment and alternative investment spaces. Feel free to check out their website at www.oncallinvestments.com and subscribe to their free educational email series. You can find On Call Capital on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also check out our YouTube page where you'll find all of the show episodes along with other educational videos. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you on the next episode.